another milestone, another video I'm making in celebration of it a significant amount of time after it passed. But hey, I'm pathologically late to everything I do and I'm still making a video, so who cares? But anyways, I digress before I've even started. The Horus Heresy, the origin story for the Imperium and one of like five different origin stories for 40k as a whole. You have to give credit to Games Workshop, they are thorough of nothing else when they put their minds to it. But what's appealing about the Horus Heresy? It's just an era in 40k's history, right? What makes it special or any way different from 40k's that already exists? And I mean between Age of Sigmar and 40k you can pretty clearly tell that yeah, there's some differences here. Even ignoring mechanical differences, one of them is pretty clearly fantasy and the other is sci-fi, or at least fantasy pretending to be sci-fi. I know both of them have space marines, but trust me, they are different. Plotlines actually have conclusions in Age of Sigmar for one. But I'm not here to complain about a 40k story never going anywhere. We're here to see if the Horus Heresy is worth getting into. We're gonna dive balls deep into whether or not you should invest in this game in the Warhammer 40k setting, or should I say the 30k setting. Mostly from a lore perspective, because lore knows I barely know enough about 40k rules as is, but I will attempt to acknowledge the rules. Slightly. A little bit. Anyways, uh, yeah, for the Emperor and or let the galaxy burn. The Horus Heresy is the defining era of the history of the setting that is Warhammer 40k. While other events are certainly important, without the war in heaven, none of this bullshit would have come about. The Horus Heresy set the groundwork for all of the Imperial armies and indeed the Chaos Space and Marine forces to come into existence. It was a time of great heroes, great villain, and great strife. Or maybe not that first one, this is still 40k. Everyone murders planets as part of their day job. Relatively great heroes, that's a good way to put it. It takes place shortly after the time period of the Age of Strife when humanity, after basically creating the Federation from Star Trek, proceeded to implode on itself. Turns out, if wizards start popping up all over the place, we should just kill them. Of course, the wizards turning into demon portals probably wouldn't have been so bad if the Eldar hadn't decided to implode their own empire. Though in their case, it was pretty much entirely their own fault. So between a fourth Satan coming into being and humanity regressing into the Stone Age at a galactic level, it was a rough few thousand years in the Milky Way. Then the Emperor came to power by sodomizing everyone on Earth who thought Jesus was a pretty cool dude with a flaming sword. Then he proceeded to do that across the galaxy to reunify humanity. He also made 21 kids who got thrown across the galaxy by their mom who thought the Emperor was a bit of a dick. Kinda hard to argue with her on that point, though throwing them into hell to get them away from him was probably just a bit much on her part. He found them all, two of them had to be control alt deleted from reality for some reason the Games Workshop should never make clear because by this point it will certainly just be disappointing, and they started conquering the galaxy together, as father and 19 horribly dysfunctional sons. The Emperor screwed off back to Earth, or as it was now called Terra, since people know to let me know I'm stupid for calling it Earth, and right before he left he said, hey guys, Horus is in charge now don't fuck everything up. And then half of them proceeded to join the forces of hell. And there's the background you need for the Horus Heresy. So why go for this setting? Why play 40k's prequel? Well, for a while the Horus Heresy was like Reach in Halo. Whenever it was mentioned it was talked about like, yeah, that sure sucked, didn't it? But there was only so much in the way of solid details to know about it. It was barely even in the first edition of Warhammer and it wasn't expanded on until 2006 when the novel started coming out. There'd be changes to the lore and retcon, sure, but nothing on the scale of what we have now. It was always this mythical time of heroes and villains that was told as if a legend was being recited, because for all intents and purposes, that's what it was. Getting into the Horus Heresy means that you can experience these legends for yourself. You can see just what it was like during this time period that was once nothing but myths and scraps of actual historical information. By getting into the lore of the Horus Heresy, you can see exactly what happened with those characters. How did events really go down? Well, now you don't need to wonder. There's dozens of books in the series. It really fleshes out the lore of the time period and sets up how the Imperium went from something that at least had good intentions, arguably so anyways, to basically being just the worst thing ever. As an extension of this, characters that didn't really have much fleshing out get to have some actual character. It's not just, yeah, these demigods sure were demigods and awesome, we can actually see what the Primarchs were each like. We get to know more about Angron, other than he was presumably a bit violent even before he became a servant to the god of violence. We get to see the full story of how Magnus never wanted to fall to chaos even as he was screwing up the Emperor's grand plan. He still definitely did very many things wrong, and if you still don't think he did, then I advise you to stop huffing copium, but he's still very tragic nonetheless. And there's still plenty of attention given to the less godly people, even though the demigods certainly get their fair share. Malcolm is one hell of a man, let me tell you. Anything special about him? Not really. He's one of the strongest not-wizards in the setting ever, but there's nothing special about him like being a space marine that made him that way. He's just a hell of a guy. Nathaniel Garo is great, Sol Tarvitz went down fighting and told his creepy BDSM dad to get bent by doing so, and it turns out that the World Eaters actually had some decent people in them before Angron jammed nails in their brains that turned off their ability to come if they weren't murdering something. Like Karn. He was a real cool dude before people started calling him the Betrayer. Who'd have thunk it? And the scale of the 40k universe is very much in full swing here. I mean, for starters, go watch that trailer that came out pretty recently 
recently if you haven't. A Titan gets obliterated by a battleship, and I'm gonna be honest, that was one of the coolest things to come out for Warhammer in a while. Makes me wonder why Hammer and Bolter has a budget of $6 and a used gas station gift card, but I'll take it regardless. There's a book called Titan Death, which is about entire armies of Titans going at each other. All in all, if your problem with 40k was that despite the galaxy getting ripped in half, not enough stuff happened in it, then the Horus Heresy is for you. And because you're playing these battles in the tabletop heresy game, it's like you're living them out yourself. Well, I mean, not really. You're some random person spending way too much money on plastic that can feasibly be considered healthy and should probably find a better hobby, like crack. Yeah, I know, glass houses. But you get to see these events play out on the tabletop in the books, which is really just something amazing. And if nothing else, if you like space marines, you're gonna like the heresy. It's as simple as that. As for rules positives, well, like I said, there's only so much going on here that I can talk about, but for what it's worth, I can say there's actually a surprising amount of diversity in the armies of the legions. Unlike 40k, where there are differences between chapters, but they all share the same basic template and only vary so much, the legions in 40k all have very different roles on the battlefield. My favorite is the Alpha Legion, whose special ability allows them to give themselves one of like six different traits at the start of a battle. They can do that after they see what your army looks like too, by the way. So have fun trying to figure out what the Black Ops army is planning before the game starts, because if you don't read their mind before starting, you aren't going to. And the Primarchs themselves have pretty damn diverse rules as well. Each of them have their own niche they excel at. So Magnus is good at magic, Gilliban buffs his army, and the line is only good because he doesn't need to talk to anyone when he's chopping heads off. If you've seen the math of some of the Primarchs fighting each other, you might think some of them are pretty dog shit. And when comparing to each other, yeah, some of them might be awful. But I'd argue that's not really how you're supposed to use them. Don't throw the Primarchs at other Primarchs like it's the climax of a novel. Throw them into non-character units and watch them turn whatever they're fighting into slag. Every Legion is gonna have at least one character that kicks ass, because every Primarch kicks ass. You just gotta know which ass to kick. Something that the more rabid fans of Warhammer might disapprove of, but I'm going to support regardless, is using certain 40k models in the Horus Heresy. If you run Custodes or Space Marines already, just use them in the Heresy. Hell, if you run Demons, you can use them as is. No proxies are saying this model actually counts as this model required. Sure, some people might call you lazy for doing that, and some really dickish Warhammer players might refuse to play with you, but you can rest easy knowing that you didn't spend thousands of dollars on a game fewer people are playing than 40k. Hint at downsides of Horus Heresy shown, switch back to praise. As for the models of the Horus Heresy, they are goddamn great. First off, none of them are bad in terms of model quality. Okay, thank you, Insulin Pump, for ruining that line. None of them are bad in terms of model quality, which makes sense because as far as the actual game's age goes, it's very new. There's no horribly aged models. And even beyond that, Games Workshop is putting its best foot forward here. Sure, some of them might look a little silly. I mean, these guys are trying to blot out the sun with their pauldrons. But if they do, it's in a Warhammer silly way where it's ridiculous, sure, but that's the point. Go look at the Primarchs for some top-tier modeling. My least favorite is probably Gilliman, and it's not because it's a bad model. He's just posed blandly standing there on a plinth. It still looks fantastic, just a bit dry. When the worst thing you can say about these models is some of them look a little bit boring, you know that you're in a good place. The vehicles are above and beyond what they usually are, too. In the guard video, I said that their vehicles are fine even though the rest of their models are aging. But I might have to reconsider that because the Horus Heresy shows just what vehicles can look like when they're done well. Maybe it's just because they locked their painters in a basement and wouldn't let them out until the end result was photorealistic, but either way, these are crispy. Also, the Gel Vorbeck. I'm pretty sure saying that name in public would get me shoved into a high school locker, but I don't even care. They look so good. Ah, uh, but not everything can be positive about the Horus Heresy. There must be some bad to balance the good. So what's the bad? Well, for starters, I personally think that GW revealing the history of this time period is a great thing, but by doing that it does remove any of the mystique behind the era. A lot of the fun of Warhammer can come from creating your own lore and storylines for what happened in the universe. It's a lot of fun to fill in the blank slates Games Workshop gives us. So by the Horus Heresy games and novels existing, all those homebrew settings you might have played in have been taken out back and shot in one fell swoop. Not the biggest flaw, but it can be argued they should have kept the mystery behind the story instead of developing on it. Relatedly, sometimes the lore they reveal is stupid, like when Lehman Russ went to jail Magnus and it was changed to murder Magnus. That part isn't stupid. The stupid part was when he got to Magnus' homeworld, repeatedly tried to contact him because he felt that something wasn't right, and Magnus was like, no, I cannot answer this call, I must face judgment for what I have done. Are you fucking kidding me? This motherfucker is supposed to be one of the smartest people in the galaxy, second only to his divine dad and maybe his cool uncle. And he just goes, nah, I can't answer the phone, I gotta repent. Did he think Russ just wanted to be an asshole to him over the phone? Could have saved the Imperium not only a whole lot of grief by helping them out as repentance instead of getting his entire legion killed, but cause an entire group of Chaos Marines to just not exist in the future. No, I take that back, not only not exist, they would have been loyalists, but he was drowning in self-pity, so I guess there's nothing he could have done. Gotta let the space fret, boys, glass your planet. Also, it kind of ruins his 40k 
characterization, because by that point he hates the Space Wolves for burning his home down, yet he let them do it. See what I mean by the lore being stupid sometimes? Also, the Emperor going from loving his sons to considering them as nothing more than tools. Not inherently awful, but sometimes it can feel like they changed his entire characterization away from being a well-intentioned extremist just because it would be more dramatic this way. Do you not like Space Marines? Then you won't like the Heresy. They get so much goddamn attention. To be fair, it makes sense because it's the origin story of half of the Space Marines turning traitor. But either way, if you don't care much for Space Marines, then you probably won't care much for the Horus Heresy. Unless you can subsist off the few scenes where Eldred is doing some mischievous shit in the background, that is. This point will be coming back for tabletop reasons, don't you worry. As for tabletop negatives, well, like I mentioned at the start, I can only say so much. The biggest flaw to me is that between the Space Marine Legions, they all share most of the same models. They all have something unique, don't get me wrong, but the vast majority of them are shared. Which naturally means a lot of the stats are going to be identical between armies. So while you can use these armies very differently depending on the Legion you pick, their stats are still going to be the same. Before someone shouts at me in all caps, they all come from the same empire, of course they're using the same equipment and units. I understand there's a reason for it, but it can still feel a bit bland knowing the Alpha Legion's basic marines and the World Leader's basic marines are more or less the same thing, barring special rules. Do you not care for the Space Marine factions? Stay as far away from this game as possible. I know I'm reusing the point, but I have more angry things to say about it in the case of Tabletop. The Heresy is all about marines. If you aren't playing the marines, then, well I won't say Games Workshop doesn't care about you, but you certainly aren't getting noticed as often as Johnny the Marine fanboy. To the game's credit, there is a surprising amount of solo auxilia and Mechanicum forces. Honestly, I didn't think there'd be that many models for those armies. But if you compare those to the total amount of Space Marine minis, then yeah, there it is. Again, I understand why it's like this. This is the Space Marine's climactic backstory. But that being said, why aren't there certain Xeno races? I understand the Tau aren't gonna be around or the Tyranids, but the Orcs? Why don't they get any rules? A war boss nearly killed the Emperor. Why doesn't at least that dude have a model? Or the Necrons? A single tomb world can't have opened up early for some shenanigans to let them be playable? Or, and I fully wear, I'm just simping for elves at this point, the Eldar. The Dark Elder would exist by this point, where are they? Maybe the craft worlds don't exist as they do in 40k yet, but that could open the door for an alternate army style for them. Hell, Eldred shows up in the Horus Heresy multiple times. And not for minor hee hee look at the funny elf man, funny reference bullshit, he does influential stuff. Clearly the Eldar are active. I get that it's supposed to be the marine backstory, but I don't think it would have been that hard to put over some Xeno codexes into the Horus Heresy with a few minor changes. If you mostly like marines, then this is a non-issue. Hell, it might even be an upside. But if you don't really care for marines or actively dislike them, stay the hell away from the Horus Heresy. There are actually fan-made rules I found on 1d4chan for Xeno's factions in the Heresy, though unfortunately I couldn't find them because they're apparently buried in a vault somewhere. And the game as a whole is modeled off of 7th edition 40k, so theoretically you could use the rules for Xeno's armies if you really want to play them here. But in terms of official support, you aren't getting anything. Of course, the biggest tabletop issue with the Horus Heresy has nothing to do with rules. In fact, even if you don't play the game and just want to collect the models, you'll still run into this issue. The Horus Heresy is all bought through Forge World. Forge World seems to think that Warhammer fans are all trust fund babies with infinite access to their dad's offshore banking account. Look at the standard Dreadnought. It's $55, not cheap. Now look at this fancy Dreadnought you can buy for the Horus Heresy. That'll be $31 extra, please. Oh, and not even all the possible weapons come with the kit. You have to buy them separately. But maybe that's just a bad example. Maybe that's just because the 40k Dreadnought is a relatively older model. Maybe another Dreadnought from 40k will be a whole lot more expensive. Like this one. It's a whole... Oh, it's only $5 more. It's not just the Dreadnoughts, though. God, no. Look at these vehicle prices. Look at this single gun and two Marines you can buy for $64. Look at all these upgrades. $50 for a standard Marine kit of five models. Pardon me, did I say $50? I meant $65. Actually, I meant $70. Want to spend all this money on a single knight for the Horus Heresy rather than buy three regular 40k knights? I'm never going to make that purchase, but you can. If you play the Horus Heresy, get ready to sell an organ or three. You can spare a kidney, can't you? Maybe I can flog my pancreas on eBay. It's not like I'm using the damn thing. I cannot recommend using proxy models enough if you run Space Marines. Or you know what? Play Demons of Chaos. Use your army in every Warhammer setting and laugh at the people who can only use theirs in one. Oh, and by the way, all of these models are in resin too. Go fuck yourself. Lastly, and here's something you should take with a massive amount of salt because I could be entirely wrong on this one. In my opinion, I don't know how long the Horus Heresy will be around. Unlike 40k, the Horus Heresy has a fixed time span. There's only so much that can be feasibly fit into it before it starts getting way overbloated. And it also has a very solid endpoint. Horus and the Emperor duel, Horus gets obliterated, and the Emperor sits on his god couch for all eternity afterwards. Eventually, I don't think Games Workshop will release anything else for it. It might be a ways off, but I truthfully feel like that's still gonna happen sooner or later. And when it does, I imagine the player base is gonna drop along with it. It might be slow, it might be quick, but since 40k can be developed as far into the future as Games Workshop exists, it will continue to get more releases while eventually the heresy can only stagnate. Like I said though, that's just my personal opinion. Some people are still playing Warhammer Fantasy and as a game that technically doesn't exist anymore, so it's entirely possible I'm in the wrong here. The Horus Heresy 
Accuracy is a really intriguing part of 40k, both as a setting and a game. Undeniably, it has some appeal and mystique to it, but it certainly has flaws and I couldn't blame anyone for not getting into it. Truth be told, I don't know if I'll ever collect many Horus Heresy minis or play the game ever, really. But if you really like Marines, want to explore the backstory of the Imperium of Man, and have a company credit card with a very little oversight, then go for it. Thank you, of course, to my channel members. You are the Horus to my heresy. If you don't know what that means, then not to worry, I don't either. But the continued support is greatly appreciated nonetheless. Thank you all for watching, and take care out there. Yo, uh, I know that even thinking about the words female space marines is enough to send some people into a fit of frothing rage, but I gotta be honest. Female Lehman Russ got me thinking the space wolves ain't that bad.